Opposite Mandela is a book of unique insights into an unexplored aspect of the presidency and leadership of Nelson Mandela. Joining us is the author, Tony Leon. Tony, I, I never knew what you were going through. I can remember with Paul Asherson, yes, our of late course, friend, and, yes, and uh, yes. going back into those years, that the, the strife, the struggles, the excitement, the interesting things that you've put into this book of yours, um, what got you, though, to what motivated you to now chronicle those years, the Mandela years? Well, I think the real reason was there are no shortage of books on Mandela. His secretary is about to bring one out. The, his jailer brought one out. His confidants have brought them out, the authorized biography, the unauthorized biography. But no one other than F.W. de Klerk, whose book ends in 1996, had looked at Mandela through the lens of being in opposition to him. And um, I thought that this was a necessary and an underexplored aspect of both the phenomenon of Mandela's leadership and what it was like to experience it, mm -hmm. as we say, up close and personal, both in an affirming way and sometimes, as I do point here, out here, in a hostile way, because mm -hmm. Mandela was a very rounded person. That meant he wasn't a saint, he wasn't a genius, he was a brilliant leader, but he was also a very, very engaged, partisan ANC politician. And what I tried to show was at critical moments, he could put the country above party, but sometimes the party was everything. And um, this book, based, as we say, on my real-time experiences and counts with him, tries to put that side of the picture forward. I hope to give a more rounded view, really, of, of what really, uh, as J.M. Kutsia said, um, is probably you know, the last of the great leaders in the world, never yeah. mind in this country. As a discerning reader, though, you, you, you start off saying you almost uh, hero worshipped him. You're really like the rest of us. But it, it goes through, as you go through the book, you realize as a reader that this was a, a man, not a god. This is someone who had make, made a few missteps along the way. And in fact, if the last uh, conclusion that, that, that I came to from reading your story was that some of the seeds of the problems that we're dealing with right now, specifically corruption, cater deployment, etc., could have been stamped out, could have been addressed by Mandela, but weren't. Yes, and I do, and I, that is correct. In fact, you know, there are three chapters here. I, I started with one, it unfortunately got to three, about what I called the blind spots of the Mandela era. And, and there were far more golden moments than blind spots, just to give it perspective, and that's why we remember quite appropriately Mandela so well and so fondly. But the point I make in the book is that Mandela uniquely had the moral authority, the stature, to stamp down on certain things. And at some critical moments, when the corruption scandal started on his watch, the Serafina II saga with Inkosasana at Lamini Zuma, more materially the Sol Kersner bribe uh, situation with Stella Sakao and the Transkai gaming licenses, which uh, of course led to the expulsion of Bantu Holomisa rather than actually any acknowledgement that the ANC had acted incorrectly in that matter or indeed some of the leading personalities whom, to his credit, Bantu Holomisa at the cost of his own very high position, the ANC exposed and was cast into the outer darkness. Ironically, only resurrected toward the end of Mandela's life when he was brought back by the family to an honored place at Mandela's sickbed and ultimately uh, at his funeral. And then there was a third element, which was a very underreported at the time, and that was the December 1997 Mafeking conference mm -hmm. of the ANC, their 50th conference, where Mandela made a four and a half hour speech, mm -hmm. I kid you not. Uh, which people say it was written by Tabo and Becky and uh, it had been second, uh, second redrafts by John Nechatenzi, but the truth is Mandela delivered it as the outgoing president of the ANC, which lambasted civil society, the media, all opposition parties as being part of some counter-revolutionary movement mm -hmm. and green-lighted what we know today to be cadre deployment of ANC officials everywhere across society, in business and elsewhere. And I think some of those problems today that we experience and some of the challenges that you so eloquently identify on your various platforms as impeding economic growth and, and market economics taking off here started then. Now, that's not to say that Mandela wasn't having to balance a whole range of contradictions. And I somewhere in this book quote from that marvelous poem by Walt Whitman, do I contradict myself very well, I contradict myself, I am large, I am filled with multitudes. I mean, Mandela was a multi-dimensional person. He, he wasn't one thing or the other. He was several things. And when, toward the end of his life, uh, people said, well, you know, was he a communist or was he this? 
uh, Bill Keller of the New York Times very perceptively wrote, it didn't really matter because he was an adaptive politician. And he didn't govern as a communist, and he didn't run a communist presidency, and he didn't bequeath South Africa a communist constitution. And, and I think that's so true as well. And I, I hope, in, in my own contribution to that history of our recent times, that I've tried to reflect on that complexity, but in an interesting and hopefully human way as well. Alec also mentioned that uh, you touched on the people that surrounded Mandela at the time. One such individual we spoke to earlier this mm -hmm. week, Getzo Gordon, uh, chief, current chief executive of PPC. Uh, he was a really uh, essential to the whole ANC's electoral strategy. He was their campaign's chief in 1994. Incidentally, the ANC got the same percentage under Mandela as they got under Zuma two weeks ago. So mm -hmm. some things don't change. Uh, but of course, Ketso Gordon, and I think I mentioned in the book, was also part of what you might call Mandela's economic kitchen cabinet. So he took advice, and the other guy, of course, was Tito Mbaweni, who did me the honor of launching this book last night in Santon. Um, there were some really engaged people around Mandela who themselves didn't come from a business background, but today are very involved in business. But I really think, you know, had a sensitivity to the needs of a market economy, as, of course, did Mandela. You know, for all his, his revolutionary background, I do recount how when uh, Derek Keyes was uh, resigning quite suddenly as the Minister of Finance, Mm -hmm. Mandela left of dinner early to go and phone, you know, the four business leaders of South Africa, Harry Oppenheimer, Anton Rupert, um, Marina Starling, Donnie Gordon at that time. In those days, you could make four phone calls probably and cover the table mm -hmm. um, because he set enormous store by getting the buy-in not just of his party, but of his advisors and of people way outside of the Mandela circle whom he believed were necessary to move South Africa forward, such as that is very significant business leaders of the 1990s. It, it was, it's a great, it's a lovely book. Uh, great is difficult to say, but for people who've lived through it, who've, who've tried to get a balanced perspective of it, there's so many of those little uh, insights as you've now shared with us. But the one that we all forget was Mandela was very much an inclusive politician. He wanted you to join the cabinet. Yes. Now looking back, might that not have been a smart thing to have done? Well, that is, you know, it was a really difficult uh, decision to make and, um, because it came from Mandela. Uh, and I do call it in the book, the chapter is called The Temptation. It was the terms that he set in the end when I started to having several discussions with him about what it would mean. He said, look, basically, you can criticize inside the cabinet, but you can't go outside and, and make your opposition to decisions we've arrived at collectively known. And I thought, well, that would be the death knell of the Democratic Party. And what I did in this book was to reflect, well, what would have happened if I'd got that? Because, you know, I wouldn't also mind an executive office and hmm. executing policy from the heart of government. And maybe some of, and some of my supporters, people like Bobby Godsell and uh, the late Harry Oppenheimer, were very uh, persuasive that I should take it. Other people like Van Zyl, Slubbert and Helen Susan said, don't touch it with a barge pole. So there was plenty of advice. But um, the thing that really decided was that we wouldn't really have been able to continue as an opposition party. Uh, outside of that. And I just wonder 17 years later if South Africa would have an independent opposition because mm -hmm. at that stage in 1997 the Democratic Party was making the running as an opposition, although we only had seven MPs. Now the Democratic Alliance got 89 MPs, but there might not have been 89 MPs if we'd been absorbed into government then. I, it's one of those what if questions. Alex. Won't you throw me the book because we'd like to. Uh, we'd Absolutely. We'd, I, hopefully I've suitably inscribed <laughs> it. Good. <laughs> we want to put it up there, but. Sometimes, uh, where are we going? There we go, over there. That's what the book looks like. So it's pretty easy to pick. A very young looking Tony Leon in well, the picture. Well, was 20 yeah. years ago. Wow. <laughs> but sometimes being in the tent means you can make more of a change. And that's what I, I was interested in getting your view on. Had you been in the tent, you would have had more of a close up view of what was going on rather than adversarial, which sometimes, you know, what do they, what do they say? A, 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 a symbol. Uh, a bucket full of bile is not as powerful as a thimble of honey. Yes. Looking well, you, you are reflective. So did you ever reflect on I, that? I reflect on it for the last 17 years, particularly uh, because I, I wondered, you know, both, both those stories, w would I have been able to do anything? What really put me off as well at the time was the ANC had just decided on CADA deployment and they said you mustn't be ANC after hours. My friend Tito Mboweni actually said that, ironically. Mm -hmm. You have to be ANC all the time. And, you know, I wouldn't have been able to appoint the director general I wanted. It would have been someone from uh, the yeah. ANC background. Yeah. The staff in the ministry would have been basically, a lot of them would have been ANC. And I don't know how much I would have been able, if I'd, 
they said, look, you're going to be Minister of Public Enterprise, was suggested. But I'm a privatizer. I believe the government does not do things as efficiently as private enterprise. I would have been all in the forefront of selling off a lot of those enterprises to make them more competitive, to make them more efficient. And yet there would have, government mm. policy would have been to the contrary. Mm. I, I mean, I did wrestle with this and resolve it much later on, when I, just when I stood down from Parliament and President Zuma, quite generous, said, wouldn't I like to be an ambassador? Subject of another book. Mm -hmm. And there I thought you can serve the state without being a member of yes. the party. And, and I tried to do that in South America. Whether I could have done it here, well, it's one of those what ifs. You see, I, mm. I think the, the evidence was uh, very finely balanced. And talking about business people, the late, and I regard him as a very great business uh, leader, Les Boyd, who then was the deputy chairman of Anglo American, one of my business informal mm. consultants. Uh, I said to Les, I don't know what to do, you know, because on the one hand, this and the other. He said, follow your gut instinct. Mm. So I said, well, my gut keeps changing. He said, follow the first one. <laughs> and the first one was that mm. the, the terms of admission were tempting but were too high. Mm -hmm. Just to close off with that, we ha are being told that our time has now come to an end. We have to go and listen to Vladimir Putin. He's got real power. exclusive. Absolutely. Would you ever go back into politics? You know, I, I've, I've been there and I, I was 20 years an MP, 13 years either party. I, I never say never, but I'm, I'm doing other things. And I strange enough think if you're not in the pit of partisan politics, important though it is for democracy, you can often have more influence and, and you have a wider audience. I mean, when I was the leader of the DA, one looked at me through the lens of the DA and I'd look at the world through the DA lens. Now, I, I don't do that, although obviously I'm part of what I was as part of me. I, I try and be, take a slightly wider view, and I do find, as, as you know from your very good writings, that it is better that way than just saying, I've got to bang the party drum.